So I just wanted to say welcome to everyone um, in this fourth interview in the series on um, Envisioning the Global South. Uh, it's part of an interdisciplinary conversation that we're doing through the Max Weber program at the University of, um, at the European University. Um, my name is Maria Dira Castilla, and I'm really happy that we have Professor Janima Pierre with us today, who is based at the Department of African American Studies and the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Professor Pierre has worked extensively on global racial formation, political economy and resource extraction, transnationalism, and the history of anthropological theory, among many other topics, and is the author of The Predicament of Blackness, Postcolonial Ghana, and the Politics of Race. She's one of the editors of a recent special section in the American Anthropologist entitled Anthropology of White Supremacy that confronts two key challenges head on. One being the need to understand white supremacy as a global system of power, and the other being the white supremacy of the discipline of anthropology itself. So today we'll be talking about this special section and Professor Pierre's article in it titled The Racial Vernaculars of Development. So we're going to spend about 30, 45 minutes on the first part before we open up for questions and a broader discussion. And just to let you all know in advance, the session is being recorded and will later be available on YouTube. Thank you so much for being with us today, Professor Pierre. And I was wondering if we could start off with a little bit about the background or impetus uh, for putting together this special section on the anthropology of white supremacy. Oh, yes. Um, thank you so much for having me, Maria. So good to see you again um, after all the a couple of years. Um, and so I'm so grateful to be here at the Max Weber Institute um, and to be talking about this very uh, important topic that doesn't get enough um, <laughs> play, I suppose. Um, so to answer your first question, you know, the, this is an ongoing conversation that we have as um, scholars, especially as anthropologists of color. Um, um, in the U.S. in particular, and also throughout uh, the, the, the world, um, is there's this idea that, um, that it's, and this was, it, so I guess I should say, okay, so the, the special issue comes out of a special session uh, uh, in, uh, at the American Anthropological Association um, conference in 2016. And that conference happened right soon after Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. But we put together the panel long before Donald Trump was even considered a viable candidate for presidency. So we put together the panel in February. And then um, by the time you know, the conference came, which was in November, Donald Trump had been elected. But we put together the panel because we saw this recurring pattern of not really recognizing the people really like to talk about race as racism only, right? So the fact that you know there are you know the um, Donald Trump's rhetoric, um, you know, making explicit racist statements and so on and so forth, and you know, really having a lot of people outraged, right? And saying you know, and 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 people in the U.S. saying, well, this is not who we are. You know, we are Americans. We're not racist like this. And and then we saw the same, you know, similar conversations happening in anthropology as, you know, this is the racism over there. Um, what we do is not, and as scholars of scholar color, we know that is very different, right? We know that's not the, the case. Everything from who gets hired, who gets cited, um, um, which research is considered um, theoretically sophisticated, which research project is deemed um, 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 a real anthropology. I used to get that all the time. That's not real anthropology, right? And so, so, so we knew that, and so we discussed. We decided to. Why don't we have a a, a, a panel at the American Anthropological Association annual meeting on and, and call it the Anthropology of White Supremacy, which we focus both on our individual research projects, which back then was on this um, the racial vernaculars uh, paper, and then um, and all of us who are doing different works, but also focus on the the discipline itself as being a site of, of, of white supremacy. And, and sure enough, our panel was scheduled for the worst time. It was like Sunday morning at 8 a.m. And I think if I remember either Thursday or Sunday morning, which if you know, if you go to these conferences, the main days are like Friday afternoon. Um, the conference goes from Thursday to Sunday afternoon. And the main days are like Friday afternoon, Friday morning, 
um, Saturday morning, but we got this slot, which meant that there will be no one at the at, at the conference at, at our panel. But surprisingly, it was packed, and I think part of that is people assume that Donald Trump meant white supremacy as opposed to all these other things. And so that's really what what started. And um, and I have to say, at the panel, most of the questions were about Donald Trump and not about our individual papers, which was really frustrating because we were trying to talk about the structures of power, both within our research project and also within the discipline. But everyone really equated white supremacy to Donald Trump's language and, and so on, and um, really did not um, engage us uh, on the actual presentations. And so after that, we decided that maybe we should um, publish this um, um, in, a, in a big forum so to, to, to really engage uh, with the points we were making. No, oh, that's really interesting. Um, and I think what you were saying about Trump specifically kind of points to uh, some of the things that you raised in the introduction in terms of what, what it does to only think about white supremacy in terms of white supremacist groups instead of as, as a global power system. And I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about the difference in, in um, like how we think about that analytically and how we approach it, um, those differences. Right. And so it is It is easy because especially these days with the rise of, um, well, more rise, <laughs> and enhanced rise of, of uh, white supremacist groups all over the world, right? Especially um, not all over, all over the Western world, I should be very specific, um, in Europe, um, in the US in particular, um, you know, and um, Australia, New Zealand, and so we think about the massacres of, of people of color and religious minorities um, for the past, you know, 10, 12 years, like major massacres, like the New, New Zealand Christchurch massacre and, and all of these things. And so when these things happen, people are shocked, right? And they're saying, oh my God, well, some people are shocked, right? They're like, oh my God, this is not who we are as a nation and so on. But what we wanted, what in, in, in doing that, we forget that the, our entire structures of power, the entire world that we live in right now is actually structured through a particular kind of historical experience where you have European control, Western control of the world um, through everything we can think of. And that begins with the you know, 1492 and the, you know, the expansion of Europeans and the construction of this modern world. And so then part of it is to understand the localized articulations of white supremacy of white people um, or people who are racialized as white thinking that they should have more power, that they should be in charge, that they are superior to other groups. We have to understand the system that buttresses um, those ideas, right? And those ideas don't come from out of nowhere, right? They come out of a systematic and long historical um, um, uh, development of, of, of these notions of, of, high, of notions of human of human difference and hierarchy, right? And so, for a to think of a white to think of a white person to think of, of themselves as well, I am better and I'm superior, and therefore I should have you know these people should not come in come in here and they should not come into my country or they should not have access to particular sets of resources because these should be reserved for white for white people means that there's this notion of what white people are supposed to be, that they're supposed to be superior, that they deserve everything. And that doesn't come from out of nowhere. That comes from, you know, the, the modern world as we know it. And so, you know, a, an objective look at the world reveals that, you know, the structures of white supremacy were established through the history of European expansion, the colonization of the Americas and dispossessions of First Nations, the enslavement of Africans, the governance, classification and ordering of peoples, Right through racial science, um, as well as you know the capitalistic uh, capitalist economic system dependent upon this difference. So what we see is the current international power system, which emerged through the 15, you know, emerged in the 15th century, emerged through violent conquest, colonization, and the you know the presumed universal legitimacy of European and racialized white power. And so the, I think the impact of this power system continues to have global, cultural, social, political, economic reverberations. So, you know, so if we think about the fact that third world, so-called third world or the global South nations are part of a global economy that is dominated by white capital, right? Um, white international lending institutions. And I, when I say white, I mean structurally white, right? Because they're based in the West, 
and, and they make those decisions. Even the, you know, the distinction between Global North and Global South actually is a racialized distinction, right? And so you don't see supposedly white nations as part of the Global South. Right, um, and 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 in, in you know in terms of like the way that the world is structured, and so part of that is linked to everything else. And I think there's a there's an inability to think. So we have to shift scales, right? So I think there's an inability to think between and um, going from scale, one, one scale to the next, especially as anthropologists, right? Because we think in localized terms, and we don't not we anthropologists think in very localized terms, and um, and it's hard to go back and talk about structures of power and then when you talk about structures of power then people don't want people always say well what's going on in the ground is that everything being felt the same way of course and everything's not being felt the same way but that still doesn't explain the fact that so the so-called international community is very much run by the west right if we think about decisions the un we think about you know the imf and the world bank if we think about nato we think about who runs the world and we think it's the white west and the west was created as white you know, during this expansion. And I think that's an important beginning to actually understand, you know, how to think that. And so then that's articulated locally, you know, in various, in different nations where, you know, in the US in particular, where white people think that they are, uh, they are supposed to have all the power. So if they see, you know, especially with, you know, Barack Obama, or if they see people who don't, they don't think deserving of being in positions that are reserved for white people, then they're like, well, this is crazy. But who decided that certain things are reserved for white people, right? And so to, to get to that, you have to understand how historically and structurally these things, um, the notions of whiteness and white, and, and white privilege and white power then really shape individual actions on the ground in different spaces. I think that's really interesting also in terms of how, I think not just in anthropology, but in social science in general, there's, not a lot of like it's very easy to talk about capitalism as a global system without anyone questioning that you know no one is saying that and then saying that it's the same everywhere like we all agree that it has like all these local manifestations and and very like complex differences between how classes operate or whatever but but we can all agree that it's a global system that that has a global logic to it but then somehow the same kind of logic if you say that well there is no capitalism that is not racial capitalism, right? Like, like Robinson says, then somehow there's a, no, 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 but racism has to be somehow local in a different way from how capitalism is global, which to me is also kind of an example of how at least Northern-based social sciences still operate on this logic of white supremacy because racism has to be this individualized, particularized, um, Thing that has to do with prejudice so that you can somehow escape you know as long as you don't have uh, as long as you don't identify with these like crazy ass american racists then then you can somehow be differentiated now i'm just rambling but i just think that the the, the differences between how like what is considered to be global and systematic is very often only linked to critiques of capitalism instead of critiquing capitalism as a racial as a racial structure right and you know you have to ask people so how did the ports of you know western europe get built the shipping industries that that grew i mean this is why we you need to read scholars that are not just white scholars like eric williams said you know wrote about this in you know in 1940 right like this this is, you know, without this, the trade in Africans, without the European commercial trade in Africans, we would not have capitalism as we know it. We would not have the shipping industry, the insurance industry, we would not have all of this. In fact, it is because of the trade in Africans and the colonization of the Americas that we have the industrial revolution, which then ended up, and, and you know, this is interesting because part of it is like, I, I wanted, when we get to the article, the racial vernacular, because because it was like, it, it, there's this, you know, cert, you know, there's this link conversation, right? So you have the industrial revolution and the need to, and that is linked to capitalism. And then you have people saying, well, we need to end slavery. So let's go colonize the African continent. But really, you know, so thinking about the white saviors, right? I mean, we'll talk about that later, but, but, but the whole point was you don't have any of this stuff without the, 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 the turning of the humans, right? Into commodity. And then removing them from, you know, from, you know, from, from, 
our un understanding of what the human species is, which is what anthropology did, right? And that's what our, uh, the, the anthropology racial scientists did. And so to, to not understand that you don't have the ports in England, the ports in France without enslaved, Portugal in particular, right? Without, you know, enslavement of Africans and you don't have the wealth without enslavement of Africans, then, then you're starting from a really terrible position. Then your 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 analysis is not going to be right. And then the other thing is to understand that you cannot have the wealth of Belgium without what King Leopold did in Congo, without the killings and the slaughter of the ten million Congolese, without all the wealth of the Congo. Um, then we can't, you know, we can't have that conversation if Europeans, especially, don't understand that their wealth depends on the death and exploitation and, um, and, and you know, of the rest of the world, right? And, you, you know, at one point, the sun never set in the, year, in, in the British empire. And what does that mean, right? It, it means that this empire was sucking all the resources out in order to have, you know, the gold on the queen's, you know, crown, right? And, and, and the diamonds and so on and, and her continued wealth. So, yeah, so I, you know, so I don't, I can't have that conversation with someone who doesn't realize that capitalism is based on the selling and use of, 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 of African people. And so, because if we don't start there, then what conversation is there to have? Because then we're not really dealing with historical reality. You know? No, exactly. Um, also in connection with that, like how does, uh, what does it also mean then to think about white supremacy as, a central organizing logic, not only of capitalism, but of Western modernity as, um, as a historical formation. And it, how does that challenge, you know, liberal understandings of democracy and progress? Um, I think that's also quite interesting for us at the European University Institute, because it's, it's a very European institution and, and a lot of the research is based on what's going on in the EU and so on. But you do see that some of the basic assumptions about the value of liberal democracy, for example, are just reproduced. Um, not critically examining what, what the relationship is between certain ideas of progress, for example, um, but also certain particular ways of doing democracy that that are implicated within this global system of, of white supremacy. Right. I, well, yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the one of the better persons to talk about this is Charles Mills, the philosopher, right, um, that he talks about the joint march of liberalism and democracy. Well, the first thing, the, the basic thing we have to say is colonialism was part of liberal democracy. And as Cesare would say, would say a civilization which justify colonization and therefore force is a sick civilization, right? And so, you know, um, so to talk about the virtue of being human, to talk about liberal democratic governments, to talk about freedom while you have enslavement and colonization means that there's something deeply wrong with the with liberal democracy, the notion of liberal democracy to begin with. So if we start there, that their conceptions of the human was was not in, you know, was, did not include all, it was completely exclusionary, then, um, you know, uh, then, then to do that then is to actually challenge the entire, the entire, the entire uh, uh, conceptualization of the West as this free and fair, um, 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 you know, uh, fair place with ideas of freedom um, and so on, because then the material consequences of imperial and colonial activity then get left out, and which means two thirds of the world, or more than two thirds of the world is left out of these conceptions. So how is that so liberal if, you know, <laughs> you know, how is that about, you know, thinking about the world, um, you know, when you have a civilization that is sick, as, as Cesare would say, you know, that, that shapes the world. No, definitely. Um, I'm conscious that we're, we might have another 15 minutes before we start opening up for questions. So I just wanted to switch gears a little bit um, and ask you about the second part of, of the introduction in terms of thinking about the discipline of anthropology itself as, yes. as white supremacy. And if we can talk a little bit about that. Well, where do I begin? Anthropology begins as the science of race. So anthropology invents the science of race. What does that tell us, right? I mean, anthropology is the science that gave us the language to 
to justify the brutalities of colonization and dehumanization and so on. So we have, you know, we can list name, we have racial science, the eugenics, right, that, that came. And, and part of that, you know, some of the key, key um, for those who know anthropology history, some of our, you know, not our, some of the key um, founders of anthropology are, you know, people like um, um, Frederick Brombach, um, uh, uh, Samuel Morton, who has a bone collection. And I have to quickly say, you know, in, um, to memorialize the, the MOVE Foundation and the people that just, just a, a week ago, uh, the Morton, uh, the, the you know, University of Pennsylvania Museum, um, which houses the Morton collection of bones, of more than a thousand bones, a, a, a large number of which were taken from Africans, right, enslaved Africans in Cuba and shipped because, and he was about phrenology and, and Morton is a, a, a racist was a you know a racist who believed in polygenesis right and polygenesis is about you know um africans being different species right africans and indigenous folks being different species and europeans and then they're not really human so and then recently it found that that these bone you know recent bones of children who were massacred by this by state violence in the u.s the move bombing in philadelphia we're still being used by anthropologists in a class. And this is, you know, and children whose parents are still alive. And, and, I, and I do want to take you all to take a moment and read that story because I, it, it really shows the deeply, the deeply, deeply, deeply long, the deep, long, deep and long history of anthropology in completely dehumanizing people and especially people of African descent. So, so, so there's that, you know, so you have the phrenologists, people who used to go around measuring skulls to talk about how Africans are different. And then you have Lewis Henry Morgan, who's, you know, the father of American anthropology and who, you know, sat there and, and really, you know, created this from barbarian, you know, what barbarism to, to civilization, right? And created the scale of, of civilization. And then from there you have Charles G. Seligman, who really is, they say the father of African anthropology in some ways, and also trained Malinowski and Pritchard and Charles G. Solomon wrote this book called The Races of Africa, where he uses the Hamitic hypothesis, right? To say that all civilization in Africa comes from Europeans and the Caucasians. So he creates this, this term, the Nilots, right? Which is supposed to explain a way why it is that Egypt, quote unquote, has civilization, but have black people. And these black people, so he calls them semi-Hamites because Hamites means mixed with white. So the Hamitic hypothesis is the theory, I don't know if you all know this, that all, civilized, all civilization on the African continent comes from Europe, right? So the Hamites, right? Traveling, um, traveling people who come in, in, and so most of the African continent, wherever you see any kind of civilization is from these Hamites. And so out of that, you have the creation of all these theories. He trains Evans Pritchard, who writes about the Sudan, right? If, if we know, and all these anthropologists were working to justify the colonial enterprise, these British, you know, the, the, the British anthropologists, the French anthropologists, right? And then you, and it, it goes forward, right? And so you have Malinowski, who's a very well known within, within anthropology uh, for writing about the Trobian Islands, right? Um, and who's, who's the introduction of his, uh, of his book is what everyone uses for field work. But Malinowski actually was in favor of colonization and, and segregation on the African continent. And he worked with Frederick Lugard, who is the architect of indirect rule on the internet, an anthropologist, right? So this is like a long history. And then you have, these are the people that create the context, the terms, the words that we use, the way that they abuse the word ethnicity, kinship, tribe. These are the terms that these anthropologists use to describe Africa. Seligman, for example, is really well known for this, the split of the African continent, basically saying, you know, that's why we still have North Africa versus so-called Sub-Saharan Africa, which is a very racialized term. So there's a way that anthropology really set the stage for, for, the, for the way we conduct research, for the way we talk about the African continent, for the way we talk about Asia, Latin America, and so on. And then it continues, and it continues to today because the contemporary anthropologists use these same terms, these same concepts, these same, you know, these same analytical framework that they never really challenge. And so the, the foundation of the discipline is based on white supremacy and racism. 
and we and and those who practice it can perpetuate it because they never challenge that foundation and they take the terms of deployment and continue on as if this is not the case. And so even when there's like the notion of cultural relativism, which is still about not dealing with the structures of, of anthropology, um, which is still about you know thinking about distinct groups, right? Um, even when there's a liberal tradition within anthropology, it perpetuates this, this white supremacist structure um, in ways that continue to be really problematic and, 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 um, and, and, and disturbing. Yeah. But then um, what are the implications in terms of thinking about um, anthropology in terms of studying white supremacy? Like, is it even, <laughs> is it even useful? Well, I think, you know, it is useful in the sense that I, I, I think anthropology is difficult. And one of the critiques that we had in that article was that what's difficult about it because it's focusing so much on localized, you know, notions of, you know, humanity, right? Which is why one can go in some village, you know, suppose it's a village, so, you know, uh, you know, I still have colleagues who study, who think that they're hunter gab the gatherers that haven't touched, that haven't had any connection with the outside world and so it's still easy to say well you know these Africans are like these little groups of people have not had any contact with people outside and and so the particular local particularities which I actually to be fair I think it's important to know local particularities but you cannot study when we have an interconnected world you can't talk about the local in isolation from the global and one of the things that I've always stressed in terms of especially in terms of my own field work is or my own work in, in anthropology is like you have to toggle between the both both because you can't like understand like how resource extraction works for example in in west africa without understand the global structures of power that actually make it so that one can go into this country and extract its resources without <laughs> without much pushback right and so 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 i think for anthropology what needs to be studied i i think what's what's being lost is not enough studies of structures of power, not enough studies of places where, you know, um, whiteness is being constructed and reconstructed in, in, in ways that are so detrimental to the rest of us because anthropology is still left um, going to the native, right? Going to these places on the African continent, in Asia, in Latin America and finding the other as opposed to thinking about the structures of power as opposed to, you know, studying what it is, what is it about Europe that that allows it to 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 enact you know a, such a long history of brutality and exploitation but then we don't we can't understand what what allowed that to happen and how is it that there's no you know reckoning right of of, of these centuries of exploitation and, and 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 brutality so I think you know the the you know Africans you know African anthropologists have always said the gaze needs to be reversed um I, and I think that's one important thing I I, I don't understand you know, I think it's important to, to study, uh, but I think it's imp more important at this point to study structures of power because, uh, and, and to study Europe, to understand what is going on um, with these Western nations that, you know, to allow certain things to happen, that to, to say, for example, that, you know, we have patent law, so then we'll let half the world die from COVID and not, you know, open up the spaces. What is wrong with, you know, because the truth is, if we use the logic of anthropology and the white supremacist logic of anthropology, we'd be like, well, what is wrong with these governments? You know, like they need better governance, right? You know, what is wrong with the corruption of these Europeans who are giving all their money to foreign pharmaceutical companies? If we really switch, if we use anthropological language, we'd say, well, you know, there's something wrong with them. There's a curse, right? Like they, you know, they, they have a curse, a resource curse, because they don't want people's resources, right? And so that's the language they use for Africans. If we can turn that language, it'd be fast, it'd be fascinating to see. And it would actually help the discipline change quite a bit. Yeah. Linking that to the piece that you have in, in the special section um, called the racial vernaculars of development of view from West Africa, you um, do kind of switch the lens, right, and and lay out the ways that the development sector is really filled with kind of racial codes that place African sovereignty below that of Western NGOs and Western corporations. Um, so, can you tell us a bit about how this operates in the extractive sector um, and how these racial vernaculars are embedded within global structures of white supremacy? Right. So. You know, one of the things um, 
when I decided that I wanted to, you know, I was in Ghana when so all oil was discovered, quote unquote, right? And um, and I was living there, and and I just remember everybody's like, well, you know, we can't get the resource curse. We don't want what happened to Nigeria happening to us, and and I was really fascinated by that. And then I started to think about, well, what does it mean to have resource curse? And then you know, in doing you know some research, you know, some of the same language comes right because one of the things that happens in uh, uh, extractive um the extractive industry is how the business community right the western business community because it's never really the african commu business community right um the and the so-called international community the world bank um the imf um which links extraction as part of its development package right so um what was fascinating was you know there were all these you know lately there have been all these um rules about like uh, artisanal mining, indigenous mining, um, verse, and then and well been giving money, for example, um, to African governments to stop artisanal mining, right? Because it's illegal, they call it illegal mining, right? Gold mining, and so which is you know people have been gold mining in West Africa for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? But there's nothing to stop you know this widespread corporate mining, right? Where you know one of the biggest uh, mining corporations in um, in Ghana is based in South Africa where you know they fly the planes right into the mine they load it up and then they fly out right so even the government doesn't even really know how much gold is being taken out of the house out of the out of the country so i started thinking about these things and then i started thinking about i started seeing how um writing about extraction comes through this development language so it was what are the problems to extract to the problems are governance there's too much corruption in africa and these governments are, you know, uh, they're not using their resources to um, to develop their countries because they don't have the discipline. They are corrupt, and 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 they are um, and they're you know they're enriching themselves and not the rest of the country. But look at Norway, right? So as you know, because you're from Norway, look at Norway, you know, so Norway, you know, did not suffer from the resource curse. And for everybody who doesn't know, resource curse is really, it's incredible to me that people take this seriously, right? <laughs> the resource curse theory states that um, the, the people who have the, the countries in the global south, right, who have resources are cursed with it because it's going to cause less, you know, it's going to cause more heartache and less development. And, and, and it's gonna, it, it's, it's not gonna help. It, it's, it's really a curse to have all these resources, right? And it's really applied to, um, it's really applied to the global south. And so I started thinking, well, what is a resource curse? What does it mean to say that you have a resource but you can't exploit it when the terms of exploitation of these resources come from the West, right? So you have this corporation, you know, that can, can that can, you know, a, a Western corporation that can actually say, well. I will dig. I will dig gold for twenty five years and give you two percent, right? And so, and then the, all the discussion, all the writing about you know this is how the Africans misuse you know the two percent that they get from the gold, right? From concessions and what's wrong with these Africans, right? They're so corrupt and so on. And so, in that sense, I started thinking. Well, part of that has to do with this, with the with the a priori understanding of Africans as being less than, as having this lack, right? So that no matter what you do with them, they can't do it right, right? So corruption then becomes a racial stereotype of Africans. So that even when you have, you don't, you don't even under, you don't even question this idea that um, the Europeans have every right to and exploit your resources, or you don't question there's something realism, you say, well, why is it that these Africans can't use the 2% of the $5 billion that this corporation made and to make their lives better, right? And then how, why is it that even though you have the World Bank, the IMF, the so-called e, you know, international community, the EU backing these corporations and forcing these um, countries, including the elites, right? Like the, the finance, uh, bourgeois, finance bourgeoisie to sign these contracts, right? In the name of neoliberalism, but we don't do that. So the article comes out of that and I, what I do is to talk about the history of development itself, because the development apparatus is such a big one, right? And it reminds me of when Teju Cole called it the white savior industrial complex, right? Where you have 
you know, the development studies is one of the biggest majors in most universities in the US, maybe Europe, right? And this notion is that we're gonna go help people, right? And as if it's this altruistic. And I'm sure, you know, individually it's altruistic, but there's a long history to, to the development and it's linked to colonialism and then it's linked to these war charities and then they have to change you know the white man's burden and then they have to change that after colonialism to, to 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 make it work and so really the development apparatus is for the development of the west but we pre present it as if it's for the development of the african continent so you have a phalanx of strangers and, and white kids from europe and the u.s going to africa to help when the reality is you know africa has helped them <laughs> come back so that they can make make the money but at the same time the language of that good governance capacity building we're going to go build capacity among africans um this notion of like corruption or artisanal right which was a one that we didn't really think about really comes out of you know understanding that development itself is a racializing and racialized project and so then the language that they use always points to this notion of an african lack and that but the lack is you know africans all africans are always lacking but then you know the only people that can help fix the lack are the outsiders because africans themselves can't help fix you know can help can help fix what's what's going on and and i really wanted to really um point to just a quick like uh this lexicon because what it is is like if you think about the the, the description of the african state right so, and I say this in the article, I said, you know, it's not an exaggeration to say that the state is the, the most demonized um, institution in contemporary Africa, right? So, you know, there's the fragile state, the, the vampire state, um, you know, all of, you know, what people use and, and um, to describe Africans, right? And it's like, they, they, they anthropomorph anthropomorphize the state as if, as if it's like witchcraft. People say, well, it's witchcraft. And this, you know, the state is like witchcraft. And part of that, all that has to do with the original understanding of Africans as being less than. And if you start with that, everything else you do on the African continent actually follows um, um, this order. And then it makes sense, right? Be because then development doesn't seem like it's racist because it's bureaucratic and it seems natural. And we're just going in to help. The IMF is, you know, and so we don't challenge this notion that the IMF is also a white supremacist structure. The World Bank is, um, <laughs> the U European Union. We can't say that because we take them as natural. But th that, that tells you, because we take them as natural, how powerful this notion of white supremacy is. Because these are white supremacist structures that we see as normal and natural, right? And people don't see that. And so scholars go and they talk about NGOs as if they're like, like as if they don't that as if they're neutral right and but when they talk about ngos they really mean structurally white ngos they're not talking about local ngos uh in a particular way and then so then you know and then they also don't talk about policies western policies in terms of aid where these days most of the aid goes to these international ngos as opposed to the states so then the, the international ngos have more power than the african state and then dictate the language that the local people have to use to get the money. So then all this cycle is repeated over and over again. So I'm gonna stop there because I know I can keep going. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's super interesting. And also uh, the, the lack of historical contextualization about African state making post uh, independence, where like, you know, like the sixties and the seventies were actually like boom years, both in terms of economic growth, in terms of providing healthcare for, for like universal healthcare and free education. But that is always lost in, in the narrative because the, the vampire states uh, literature is based on the situation that was created by the, the IMF and the World Bank through structural adjustment, through like literally obliterating the state and then giving, like you said, all this money to Western NGOs to kind of fill the gap of the kind of um, public um, like healthcare and, and, and education that was really provided by the state previously, but that was forced through structural adjustments to like cut those. Yeah, definitely. And I think that this is why it's important to do both like a political economic analysis of what's going on, as well as, you know, the, the analysis of ideologies and, and, and theory um, that, you know, that covers the way we think about the African continent. That this is not to say that, you know, people act badly, right? People, you know, it's not to say that people don't act badly. It's not to say that, you know, there are people on the ground, you know, um, some of these uh, uh, neo-colonial African governments that really look to Europe for guidance and, and but that, but that's what Europe 
supports, right, these neo-colonial governments to, to express this stuff. But there is something to be said as academics in particular, where you go in and you deploy this language and, and you take for granted that the UN, the IMF, the World Bank, the NGOs are working for the greater good. You do that because you believe in the power of white supremacy and whiteness. Mm -hmm. Because if, if, if you did not believe, if you, if you knew that these were representative white supremacist structures, then you would actually ask different questions and, and your research would take you different places. But that's not what's happening in, in, in our literature, right? And it's so clear on the ground, right? And so if you think about, you know, like when, when, when oil extraction is happening, for example, so the positions on the rigs, right? This is like deep sea oil extraction. The positions on the rigs are not even advertised on the African continent, right? They're advertised in Europe, right? Right. So if you think about that, right? So the people who come in who work on the rigs, there's, there's a racial, there's a racial hierarchy in how extraction works, right? And I think when my colleague Hannah Appel uh, has an article about this, right? So you have the main, you know, um, engineers and so on and so forth from Europe on the rigs, right? And then you have the workers from Asia that, that are brought in also working on the rigs, but then what's left for Africans are to provide local services like food, um, you know, service industry. And you see that, you see the demarcation and you go to the hotels where the, the, the oil workers work out and you see, you know, the white engineers and the, the middle people, and then you have the Africans doing the grunt work, right? And so this happens, you know, all the time where sometimes even government officials don't even have access to the rigs, right? Like that are way out there um, uh, on the sea. And that to me is to understand that is not, is not to say that there's something wrong with Africans, right? Because this is, this is what people say, there's something wrong with Africans, is to say that the structure of the world is so white supremacist and so um, pervasive and insidious that we can't get out of it, right? And, but, but in order to, the only way to get out of it is to recognize that it's there already, that is, this is what's saturating our lives, right? And, and within that, you get anti-Blackness, right? <laughs> Especially when it comes to Africa, because there is something specific about the treatment of Africans compared to other groups. I do think anti-Blackness is so key when it comes to Africans that, um, that, that, that is also something we need to, to, to talk about. Yeah, and that's your research as well, Maria. So, you know, you know uh, which would be interesting <laughs> for us to, to talk about, yeah. No, for sure. For sure. I have so many more questions because this is so, so exciting. Um, but I just wanted to let the audience know that we're going to open up for questions in a little bit. Um, and feel free to either raise your hand in the Zoom um, function or write your questions in the chat. Um, but just while we're giving people a chance to like gather their thoughts and their questions, um, I also wanted to ask you a bit more of a practically oriented question, um, but it also goes to what you were saying just now, in terms of how you see the responsibility of scholars today when it comes to confronting global white supremacy. I think um, the first responsibility is to acknowledge that it's there, <laughs> you know, and I think I think um, we have a responsibility, and, and I tell I say this to anthropology in particular because, you know, anthropology is responsible for um, the construction of race that we use today, and I think it's 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 it behooves the discipline then to actually deal with that and to be much more anti-racist than it has been. But I, as scholars, I think our responsibility is to acknowledge that this system is an exploitative system based on the hierarchies of race and difference. And, and then to go from there. And then because if you recognize that, then the way that we research um, is, is it becomes important because then research is not just, to me, research has to be liberatory. And, and you know, and people don't see that that way, right? They see research as like, oh, this is a cool project I'm interested in, or I'm interested in furthering a particular theory. But I don't think we, at the moment that we are where the world is so, you know, terrible and we have the hierarchies even more, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, a crazy, you know, the really horrible set of hierarchies that are, the, and then white supremacy is consolidating itself because it sees that it might lose power because we see that, right? The rise of the East, the rise of China, um, and, and so on. And you see, you know, uh, uh, you see what's happening with NATO, the EU, the Americans, right? Um, and so, so then part of that is to actually speak, speak those truths and speak you know, speak truth to power and, and talk about that power because I feel like that's what's missing, right? So how is it that the court of the Hague has never prosecuted a Western, you know, except, you know, except for Eastern Europe, 
is it Milosevic that, you know, so, but every, the only people that have been at the court at the ICC have been Africans. You know, I think George W. Bush should be at the ICC. If we're going to say this as an international community, I think, you know, I think the U.S. government, right? I think, I think all U.S. presidents need to be at the ICC because of, you know, the U.S. has caused so much destruction in the world. And I think that's what we need to do. I think we need to study power. And I know I, I say this over and over again, because studying other people, what it does is creating more data for what, right? Um, if it's not liberatory, I don't see, you know, and that's just me, you know, but I don't see, I don't see how scholarship that is not liberatory for this moment that we are living in. I don't see how that's, you know, that, that, that's good right now. You know? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so do we have any questions so far? Feel free to put on your camera and to unmute to ask any questions or just to put the questions in the chat and I'll read them up for you. I'm not the best with Zoom, but I'm like trying to figure out if I can see any hands. So far, I can't, can't see any. Um, but let's see. Ah, Roberta. Yes, can I ask like a very quick question? So maybe uh, the first one is that the more we are going on with this, with this workshop, the more uh, the white supremacy uh, seems to me to be a sort of white blindness. So, and there is a huge tension between scholars that adopt a Western gaze that try to confine their own researches into like Europe, uh, North America. So in very like Western like, space, while scholars from the global South or scholars that adopt the perspective of the global South are trying to create more inclusive narratives where uh, connections between North and South are more explicit. So I don't know if you agree with me and I would like to hear your opinion on that. And the other, and the second question that is brief, um, can you see a space where white and uh, black are not just the two extremes, but how can we um, show interconnections, not only reinforcing these two extremes? Thank you. Okay, thank you for your question. I'm actually gonna answer the second one first because one of the things that I that happens when I talk about white supremacy is I think um, people think that I think race is a thing and that white and black are like set things um, in everywhere the same. And one of the, you know, one of the things that I had to do is talk about how race, I talk about race processes of racialization, right? How it is that race is being made and remade. And so that it articulates in different ways differently, even as we do have um, uh, uh, notions of whiteness as the power and, 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 and blackness as the extreme end of that. That still doesn't mean though that other groups are not racialized, that other, and so, and so the point is, is not to say, well, black and white people are mad at each other and, and so on, but the point is to talk about how it is that various groups are racialized in a hierarchy in different ways. So, the, so much so that you have, you know, and, and, but the racialization occurs because of the dominance of white supremacy of the European world that was established with European extension, expansion and the creation, of, you know, and modernity, the, the modern, the modern moment that we have, which, which is, which puts, which supposedly puts white as the human, right? Like they're the, they're the humans, everybody else is, is, is other. So there is a wide range of people who are racialized. I think indigenous First Nations, Australia, indigenous people are racialized in particular ways. Um, people in Asia are racialized, it, but so racialization work alongside white supremacy, it just goes to show this power. The, the, the thing is, it's not about individual relationships. I'm talking, you know, and that's the other, the second thing I want to say. When I talk about race, I'm not talking about personal relations, right? And then the joke is some of my best friends are white, right? I mean, I, I joke about this all the time, right? It is not to say that I don't talk about white supremacy, right? Because it's a, white supremacy is not about personal relations, you know? It is and it isn't. I talk about the structural nature that places certain groups of people above everybody else, no matter and no matter where they are. Because one of the things that 
for those of you who work in Africa, you will know that whiteness has power and privilege, even on the African continent, even where, you know, supposedly there wasn't apartheid. So a place like Ghana, right? Whiteness has power, right? Everywhere, right? And so even when it's not about individual power, but it is structural power. And I think that's an important thing uh, to think about. Um, and I can talk about that if you want, but more about that if you want. The first part of your question, part of that is, it is, you know, position out, you know, we are, those of us, you know, who think through um, the lens of the global south or from the global south have a different vantage point of the world, which makes perfect sense. We're not looking at the world from the point, from the north, right? We're not looking down on the world. <laughs> we actually try to, we see, uh, you know, laterally and we, you know, we look laterally and up and that's, that's, that actually points to, you know, something, you know, that, that is about, you know, the way the world, the world is, is constructed, right? That people who have been, um, people who have been um, structurally and historically positioned um, uh, in this hierarchy by one small group, then have to respond in a way that assert their humanity, that places links, that says that everyone is human and that we have conversations and, and, and relationships with one another. And so, and those who constructed the hierarchies don't necessarily need to do that. And that's why you, I think you have the distinction um, between the view, the point of, points of view of those from the global south and, and, and from the, the global north. Great. Um, already seeing a lot of questions coming in. Um, the second one is from Wan Shu, um, and I'm just going to read it out because she says her place is a bit noisy at the moment. Uh, she says, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Just curious if you've encountered any research on how local staff navigate the power systems of NGOs. I heard a comment from a Ugandan friend who worked for the ICR C, which I suppose is the International Red Cross in Uganda, that it felt like an apartheid system, which was astonishing to me. Vanshu, please correct me if that was not the organization you, you meant, but yeah. Um, well, there's a lot of research these days that, um, that actually show the racism within the development in industry. Um, and, um, and what happens when you have these NGOs. And that's why, you know, when I talk about the article, it, it is about like development workers are structurally white, right? And they don't have to be white, but they're coming from the West. The West is constructed as white. They're structurally white. And so there is, the NGOs come with the money. They come with the, the backing of the West. They have complete authority, right? And so they, you know, and, and then they treat the local groups as, um, as workers for them, right? And it's not, it's never equal and it can never be equal because the power dynamics are, are, are not equal. But the other thing is that, um, you know, um, let's see, Uganda, you know, it is an apartheid system because of, you know, because of the structural nature of it, but because of the way the money's run. And then um, I was gonna say something I completely forgot, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I can come back to that, but I do think um, the way, oh yeah, so the local groups then, always have to tailor their demands based on the needs of the, the international NGOs. So you can have a group, you can have your own you know, self-help mutual aid group. And if you want funding, you have to use the language of the NGOs. You have to use capacity building. You have to use good governance. You have to use you know, all the terms that the NGO wants you to use in order to get funding. And so what does that do? It basically pulls you into the structure of the development, you know, of, of the development apparatus. Uh, a, a very good, uh, a friend of mine has a book, uh, Omolade Obundi, who writes about um, Nigerian, um, uh, during Nigerians in the Delta activists fighting against Shell, right? You know, when uh, uh, Shell and, and it's, you know, and it's destruction of, of that area being, what ended up happening is once, you know, after, after the, 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 the killing of the eight Oguni active place, you know, NGOs, international NGOs descended upon that area, right? And what ended up happening, the activism was basically turned into writing the next grant proposal, right? Using the language of the international NGOs to get money. And then all the radicalism just got completely co-opted, right? Into the NGO apparatus. And what, and that's one of the really key material response, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, material uh, 
uh, realities of what happens when the local NGOs have to deal with the money. What, and so and this to me actually points to the system of white supremacy, right? Because who controls the money? Who has access? Even though the exploitation, I mean, if you've seen the, the cartoon where all the money is coming out of the African continent and going to Europe, and then it's like, it's like Amazon, Jeff Bezos, right? Not paying any taxes, all of that, and then turning around and say, let me give you a billion dollars. You know, let me give you a couple million dollars after they fleeced you. <laughs> Right. And so and so part of that is like the NGO apparatus actually upholds this this exploitation. And then on the local groups feel like they have to change their language, they have to change what they need, what they think they need in order to satisfy it, which then really replicates the, the unequal relationship between states and between and between organizations. No, oh, definitely. I'm just, uh, the next person is Marius, but before we take your question, I'm just going to read out a comment from the chat uh, from Kei Egeru, who says, if I may add, one effect of this is that people who work for local NGOs want to move to international NGOs for more power, but I'm not sure this changes the power structure at all. The international is not localized and the white supremacist structures remain intact. Exactly. Right, because the the operative term here is the international, right? And the international in the world means white. And when they say international community, they're not talking about anybody else, right? And and it's was fascinating. You know, I was you know I was I was on on Twitter the other day, <laughs> but I saw this. You know, there's a picture of like world leaders talking about environmental change, right? And it was you know Canada, EU representative, um, the U.S. and and you know, no African nation represented, no Caribbean nation where where you know environmental change is drastically impacting life right now. You know, Saint Vincent. You know, you know, a lot of the population had to go because of a volcano erupting, right? So, and so the international community itself. So to say something is international automatically means that it's structurally white, and to want to be part of the NGOs means that you want to get more money because the international NGOs has more money, because it's structurally white, because this is a white supremacist world. <laughs> and so it's a really, it's a really crazy cycle that repeats itself. And you know, and you know, you can't get out of it. And I don't blame local people for wanting to work for international NGOs when they see, you know, these international people, because international NGO work, development work is is a jobs program for the West, right? For their young people. Right. And they see these young people getting paid in dollars or euros. And then they get paid in local currency, which is, you know, so different. And so I don't blame the young people for wanting to do that. But it doesn't, as Kuguro said, it doesn't. It, it the, the system remains intact, right? And it forces this kind of competition, even as itself doesn't have to change. Yeah. Great, um, Maurice. If you want to ask your question, also great if you want to put on your camera. It's just nice to see people. Well, uh, nice first of all. Uh, thanks. Thank, thank you. Uh, first of all, first Maria and Pia for organizing this, this great seminar and Dr. Pierre for, um, for this insightful um, uh, presentation uh, seminar. And I wanted to um, ask your opinion, I guess maybe advice as well on, on, on something you touched on um, during your presentation and what we'll be discussing right now, which is basically um, on the role of, 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 of um, I guess staff professors in the department in sending people or young anthropologists into over-researched uh, communities. Um, so recently, we, we we also organized a workshop on decolonizing fieldwork, during which we discussed like one of the uh, you know one of the texts was from the 1960s, in which uh, an anthropologist was describing the so-called so like rite of passage for American students going to um, going to studying Navajo communities uh, in, in, in southern southern America, and already the the, the problem with over over research communities and, and and year by year sending students into those communities. So I mean, I was quite shocked that we. We have known about it from 1960s that this is an issue, and yet we are still dealing with this. And this is, this is plenty, plenty of, plenty of places around the world that are being completely over researched by, uh, particularly uh, you know, students, researchers from from the global north. And we, yet we are still sending students there to those to, to those areas. So I'm wondering your opinion about that. If this is the same, this is the case also at your institution, and what can we do um, about this to somehow hopefully change this? You know. Yeah, it's it's a great question, and and it's it's really built into the discipline, right? And I think 
And, and, and part of that is a structural problem because if, you know, when you go for a job interview, they ask you, what's your area of study? And, you know, this, and it's built on this notion that you have to do field work. And, and, and for the longest time, scholars of color, in particular, um, black scholars and indigenous scholars, um, were told that if you study your own community, that it's not, um, that it's not objective, right? That, that you're too close to the community for studying a community and you need to go um, elsewhere. I do think that's changing with black anthropologists um, and Latino anthropologists in the US and indigenous anthropologists. So if you think about um, Audra Simpson's work, Mohawk Interruptus, um, which is an ethnography of her own community, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the Mohawk, who's um, Henry Lewis Morgan called the Iroquois, right? Um, and 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 so so part of that for me, I you know I send students to study structures. Uh, I you know students study structures of power. So if you're going to study uh, resource extraction, you have to go in there and talk about well, what is it that these corporations are doing? What what kind of length, you know what are these um, um, executives doing? It's, and so really shifting the lens and talking about. Um, um, the powerful. And I think, and you tell students to do that and then they'll say, oh, well, no, I don't have access. And I'm like, well, then that tells you something, right? If you don't have access to certain places, but then you can just fly into an African country and meet with a minister, <laughs> that tells you everything you need to do. And I do think it, 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 it requires the field itself to change, which is going to be difficult because it's, you know, its standards are based on this notion of Field work elsewhere, but it also requires those of us who, who are training, you know, students who are working with students to 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 push them to do something very different. And so, you know, because if somebody says, "Well, I want to go to Ghana and 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 like study flower pots," and I'm like, "Well, why don't you just go down the street and study pot, study flower pots? What makes Ghanaian flower pots different, right?" And then so so I, you know, so then I'd have to ask that, right? And 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 I think. And then part of the problem is, you know, anthropology constructs the rest of the world as distinct, right? As, as so different that all you have to do is go to another place and everything else will, you know, will be so different and you can theorize, right? Um, and so it is, it is, it's, it's a continuous problem, uh, problem, but I do think um, a lot of scholars are trying to change that. Um, if, if, if they're allowed into the, you know, in, into the, what's being read, because one of the things I show in, that we show Aisha Beliso de Jesus and I show in the introduction to the special issue is that scholars of color are not cited at all in anthropology. And so, you know, there's a review of a thousand intro, you know, to anthropology courses in the US and in, in, in Europe. And, you know, the first black scholar, for example, that cited comes a number 35 and, and, and he's not even an anthropologist, it's, it's Fanon, right? <laughs> and then the next one is like way down in the list and, and it's, it's, it's a literature person, which is great, but it's like, you know, Black anthropology has been around for 50 years, right? And so, and, and those, you know, and, and, you know, people like Faye Harrison, who has the famous book, Decolonizing Anthropology, who works with African scholars, especially South African scholars like Bernard Magubani, um, you know, who've been theorizing, right? Um, a lot of this stuff that, that doesn't really translate into the mainstream anthropology. Um, and if, if we read other scholars, we would see different ways of doing anthropology that wouldn't be, you know, perpetuating um, um, what we have now. Great. Do we have any more questions? Or comments? You don't necessarily have to have a question if you want to add something to the discussion or feel free to also put that in the chat. Meanwhile, just following up on what you said, also in terms of hiring practices, like who yeah. gets hired and like who, who decides? Yeah, who gets hired, who decides. And I've seen it firsthand and I've seen it, you know, and part of that, and this is what we talk about also in the, the, the article is, so there's something called theory. And then there's, and, and theory is like Marx, Weber, Durkheim, Foucault, you know, um, you know, Gramsci, you know, all these, you know, and then there's activists, right? And, right? and this is how anthropology, you know, and, and most of these disciplines, they do that, right? And so even when you teach, like I've taught the anthropology theory course, and you know, you have to start Mark Weber during time, and you don't like, you don't even realize, for example, that Weber was in constant conversation with Du Bois, right? So people don't know that, right? And so because they don't see Du Bois as a theorist in the same way that they use Weber. And so, so like even Foucault, right? 
Foucault was reading the Sagad brothers, right? And so if you think about, you know, uh, you know, so Foucault and the Black Panthers, right? There's an article called Foucault and the Black Panthers, right? So part of that, so most of European theory is so funny, it's taken from the global south is stolen, right? So Hegel, if you think about Hegel, you know, watching the Haitian Revolution to talk about the master slave dialectic. If you think about Bourdieu, who's you know chilling in northern Africa, right? <laughs> you know, right? But we see that as theory that's decontextualized, right? And so one of the ways, you know, if you show if you show somewhere, if you go to a mainstream anthropology department, if you talk up, you know, you have to, you know, regurgitate certain types of theoretical models, right? You have to talk about the Anthropocene, which doesn't talk about race. And really the biggest environmental disaster is the transatlantic slave trade, right? <laughs> right? You just think about what killed the environment in the Caribbean, South, you know, Africa, right? So we do that. So, so one of the ways that white supremacy continues in the field is this notion of what is theory and what isn't. And those of us who do theory, they call act this because we're not you know we don't write in a particular way or you know it does if you write about race it's not theory and the truth is to write about race is actually know a lot because it's, it's it's not a very it's not an easy thing to theorize right and so so there is there is all of that and so theory but also who gets hired right who's considered smart enough or intelligent enough and so one of the things we also pointed out too is that in the u.s in particular because you know europe i know because it's supposedly you don't have a lot of scholars of color, right? I mean, it's not reflected in in, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the fields, but in the US, there are a lot of us, right? I mean, relatively, but most anthropologists of color are not in anthropology departments in the US. And that's important to, to recognize. They're in like other departments, like black studies, ethnic studies, Latino studies, you know, Latinx studies and um, Asian American studies. And so that also tells us something about in terms of like, the value of you know what's valued and what isn't and what's considered anthropology and what isn't. But also in a lot of post-colonial contexts, uh, anthropology as a discipline was abolished, which I kind of like. <laughs> you know, because, yeah, I agree. I think you know people always joke is like, well, why do you need anthropology? Um, you know, in the African context, you know, because I do think anthropology caused so much damage to the continent. Um, to even to the way we see the continent now, like I think kinship studies really, really was did a lot of damage in terms of under you know trying to create this notion that African you know uh, societies you know are based on primordial relations that you know they're you know these are like these you know uh, enclosed groups that are not worldly that have not always been mixing and so on and so there's a way that you know anthropology has really you know anthropological theory has really um, uh, 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 really shape the way the rest of the world sees Africa, even even to today. And I do think anthropology has the most um, um, influence on how the African continent is continuously rendered even today, you know, from its earlier theories. And so at this point, what's the point in having anthropology in Africa if anthropology is based on going to see study the other, right? So what would African anthropologists go study unless they go to Europe, right? And, and study the other there, right? Which I think is necessary at this point because we have to understand why it is that this world is so terrible, you know? Definitely. We have another question from Maria Gago. Hi. Hi, Thank Maria. You so Thank you so much for your, for your, for sharing with us your, your work. You just touched about the Anthropocene and you just said that something like uh, that somehow this, this debate was not covering the, your interests. Could you share a little bit more on uh, what, what you wanted to say? And also uh, having uh, in consideration there are a lot of people that are working in this Anthropocene and also seeing Anthropo in very different ways. But if you could share what do you think is uh, your, what problems do you see in this debate? Because I think it would be also interesting for our workshop. Yeah, I mean, I don't work on the Anthropocene. I just know that the, you know, the critiques of Anthropocene is that they don't consider, um, you know, European expansion and the construction of 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 the, the experiences of enslavement and and colonization and and then and what that means in terms of the racial uh, ordering of the world, and 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 also what that means for the environment. And so, so, so part of that is thinking about how it is that you know to talk about interspecies uh, relations, to talk about, 
um, environmental degradation, to talk about the end of the world, is actually to point to you know the beginning of 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 the, this environmental degradation, and that's the colonizing moment, and 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 what that means then, you know, for the destruction. And there was a there was an article I think in Science that said that you know. Um, the most destructive part, you know, of the, you know, like colonization is responsible for, you know, the greatest environmental destruction, you know, um, in the modern times in terms of thinking about how many people and animals and, 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 and um, were killed, right? Uh, and then the, the debasement of, you know, the, 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 uh, the destruction of, of the environment, of lands, of clearing lands, of, uh, of, 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 of taking over lands for, 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 for logging and all of that stuff, but also the destruction of populations, right? And so I do think there has to be a way to think about this long historical um, uh, term or, um, you know, the, from 1492 to, to consider that and consider what does it mean then to think about what is human interspecies relationship in relation to this long history of how we construct the world. And so that, that's all. And, and I think that's what the critique is that you know we need to take into account um you know the way the world this modern world was constructed and that you know to think about the anthropocene is not to, is the anthropocene is to think about the destruction of the world is not is is not to begin recently is to go back um a few hundred years um to this to these originary moments yeah thank you great anyone else has any questions or comments are there any other issues you think we we should have covered that we we didn't? Oh, this this is a lot. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, no, thank you so much, Maria. I um I do think uh it is important. Actually, I I think if I'd be interested to see if there's anything being done in Europe um around indigeneity and um and and whiteness because uh one of the things you know because this this special issue is coming out as an edited volume um and and we have a couple of european um um uh contributors which should be really interesting to think about but uh it it, it should be it should be oh thank you roberta that's a very good one the laura polito article on racism and anthropocene um thank you for that yeah so i i think um, I think we covered just about everything. I, I, it would be interesting. I do think what we need to do is think about, well, how is it that we move forward, right? And how do we think about, you know, what's next, especially as the world is convulsing, you know, as I do think the West is, you know, losing power. And then the response is that is more violence and more racial violence. And how do we deal with, how do we deal with that as, as scholars, as humans? And, and then how, you know, and how do we move forward from there? And how do we protect our peoples? Absolutely. Thank you so much for an incredibly fascinating conversation and discussion. Um, thank you to the audience for tuning in and for all your wonderful questions. I just want to round off on behalf of our Envisioning the Global South groups, but also thanking the Max Weber program team, especially Pia Dittmar and Dashwani Grevel, who have been amazing in their support for our workshop series. A quick reminder, and I'm just going to share my screen so you can see the details, uh, that our next session will be on the 14th of May um, from 5 to 6 p.m. Florence time, where Maria Gago will interview Dipesh Chakrabarti about his latest book, The Climate of History in a Planetary Age. Oh, wow. So, Thank you so much again for being with us today. Um, if you want to stay behind with the organizers for a little bit to the chat, that would be lovely. Uh, for everyone else, thank you so much for joining. Thank um, you everyone for having me. Thank you.